that's what you were passionate about. And that's Mm -hmm. what comes through in your application. That's what comes through in your interview. And that's what human beings resonate with is, is passion. Mission Accepted Season 2, Episode 7. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Dr. Gray. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. I'm excited to talk with you. I'm excited to look at your application, share your story, and hopefully encourage many others on their path, maybe similar to yours, and show your successes and show them that it can be done. What do you say about that? Sounds great to me. I'm very excited to be here today. So... 10 interviews, four acceptances to this point. What do you think made your application so successful this cycle? I think first and foremost, applying early really helped. In preparation for today, I watched a lot of the other uh, uh, successful application videos, and I think applying early really helped. I As soon as the application opened this year, which was um, May 27th when I could submit, I submitted and I got verified a day later. And I think that really gave me a leg up so I could be kind of in the first batch of applicants to be reviewed. Mm. And then the second thing I will say is having a cohesive narrative, which I picked up from your videos and books, (laughs) just having a story and showing medical schools, what you're passionate about, what keeps you going each day, what keeps you up at night, what empowers you. I think schools really do care about your story and who you are as a person beyond the numbers. And I think I really didn't get to appreciate that until I was actually applying. So I I would say those are the two uh, main things. And notice how you didn't say like, oh, I had this theme that I crafted everything around. Like your narrative at the end of the day was your specific story, your truth. And -hmm. and as you said, shocker, medical schools care about that. (laughs) Oh, you are a a normal human being that's not like everyone else. Surprise, surprise. Exactly. Awesome. Well, congrats on all of your success. Let's go ahead and jump in and and take a look at your application and and show students what that looks like. Thank you for being vulnerable and and coming on and sharing to the world uh, what this looks like. (laughs) So as we see here, uh, yeah, you submitted the very first day, May 27th in 2021 was when you could submit. And mm-hmm. it was it was verified that very next day, which is like, wow, shocker. <laughs> uh, that, that is amazing. Now, as, as we'll get further down, submitting the very first day was not while you were why you were successful. It was potentially a part that helped get you a lot of interviews, etc. Mm-hmm. But your story in of itself is phenomenal and your stats are good. So for everyone watching, if you have a 2.5 GPA and a 480 MCAT score, applying the first day isn't going to help you, right? It's it's not this like modern uh, cure-all that's going like, to mm-hmm. wipe out all of the bad stuff in your application. So great job getting everything ready. How were you ready to submit the first day? Yes. So at my college where I went to, we had a committee letter application cycle. So we started writing our application September, the year that the year before the application opened. Wow. And so before I even submitted or before May 3rd, which when the application actually opened, I already had my application ready to go. I had been editing, editing it with my advisors, with mentors, with anybody I could get my hands on to read my application. Um, so I think the advice I have for students is to start your application as early as possible. It's never too early. Even if you're just drafting your uh, personal statement or your work and activities, I think that can give you a huge leg up and also relieve some stress on the student's part. They don't have to worry about drafting their personal statement a few weeks before the, (laughs) (laughs) you know, it happens, you know, life happens. I think just starting as early as possible. um, That's what kind of helped me prepare. I had a great college on my, on my side. (laughs) So what you're saying is procrastination can be bad sometimes. (laughs) Yes, for sure. (laughs) All right. So, uh, as we continue down here, we have, um, uh, kind of going through your demographics and we get to a disadvantaged essay Hmm. and, and you mark that, yes, you were disadvantaged, uh, and I read this, and, and I recently released an episode on the pre years about an alternative way to think about the disadvantaged essay. Because too many people think of it as this like pity essay of like, oh, you need to pity me and show me that I come from nothing and look at me. And ultimately, what it is in my mind is a context essay. It gives the reader context about everything else they're going to look at 
in my application. And here mm-hmm. you did a great job. You you talk about immigrating from this country, the situation that you were in, four of us living in a one bedroom apartment with another family of four, right? There's eight of us uh, mm-hmm. and then needing to move out. You have a baby brother and all of a sudden things are untenable. You have to move out. You have to move to a different area, worse schools, et cetera, et cetera. And you just mm-hmm. paint this picture. You give context to your upbringing, to your situation. Now, a lot of people, and and we'll get to your GPA and stuff like that, a lot of people with really good GPAs like yourself will go, well, I'm not disadvantaged because I have a good GPA. I'm like, no, that's not the point (laughs) of the disadvantaged essay. Again, it gives context. Mm -hmm. Context of, wow, you still did really well in college despite coming from this lower socioeconomic, a little kind of unsure housing situation, uh, education system, whatever that is, here's mm-hmm. the context from for for everything that you're going to view. So again, great essay here for a disadvantaged essay. Um, <clears throat> uh, I just highlighted here the the SES disadvantaged on this printout uh, is an automatic generation based on education level of your parents, uh, and we have mm-hmm. this redacted out on yours, um, but obviously whatever it was, it, it triggered to say that you were socioeconomically disadvantaged. Uh, again, that's just an automatic thing from the AAMC. Mm-hmm. Um, and we get to uh, no misdemeanors, institutional actions, felonies, that's obviously wonderful. And then we get to the grades and we go, okay, let's see the grades. You come from not the most stable upbringing, immigrant to this country, learning a new language, all this fun stuff. And we get Mm -hmm. to your grades and we're like, oh, you got really good grades here. (laughs) This is phenomenal. Um, So obviously for immigrants, education is is a way out for a lot of uh, immigrants and and why a lot of people come to this country um, to get a really good education and hopefully uh, do better than previous generations, right? That's the whole hope of of parents. That's Um, the dream. That's the dream. So uh, obviously we see lots and lots and lots of A's here, uh, which is phenomenal. We get down to your GPA in that senior year, you should be really, <laughs> really disappointed that three. I know. What can I say? <laughs> Drop the ball. <laughs> um, so obviously phenomenal. Three nine eight overall science. Three nine eight all other. Three nine eight total GPA. Phenomenal. Can't can't get much better than that. Um, and then your MCAT score. Great score, mm-hmm. right? It's it's about average for matriculants to medical school. So that's great. Your car score, shockingly, right? 124 for ESL students. It's it's right. not a surprise, but mm-hmm. the rest of your scores are great. 511, great score. So you have really good stats to back up this early application. So again, I don't want to dismiss, yes, applying early is important, but it's not everything. You need to have mm-hmm. the good stats to back it up. So great job with that. So again, context-wise, an immigrant to this country, ESL student, great stats. All right. I'm liking what I'm seeing. Now let's, <laughs> let's, let's look at the rest of the story. Um, so I see here this patient navigator that you have, um, and in Washington Heights, New York city, you have this, uh, from New York Presbyterian, uh, you are this patient navigator. You only have it for two months here. And I, I just put a question right. mark because this is when you submitted your application in May of 2021. A mm-hmm. lot of students aren't aware of like ex- expanding out that end date for when they expect to start medical school. Now you did do that below. So I know you know about that. So right. then I go to, okay, this was just a two month thing and, and you stopped doing, is that correct? Yeah. So basically it was a specific center where it was only for patients in a specific zip code because these are patients who are underserved, don't speak English, don't have access to vaccines the same way everybody else does. So they opened that site only for those specific months. And then after that, they basically shut it down. It was in an armory, like a sports armory. Okay. Um, so yeah, it was only for those two months. So I didn't want to expand the day just because I didn't want to be dishonest about yeah. you know how many hours I was uh, giving in. Perfect. Perfect. So I, I did right here, uh, could have shown more interaction or impact, right? You right. get a general description of it. Yes. And and sometimes that's okay, right? Mm-hmm. For for only two months and 50 hours, maybe there wasn't anything super impactful that you could really write about. And that's mm-hmm. okay. I'm just saying you could have, if there was, 100%. Ma- made right. it a little bit more impactful. Um, so that's, that's the first one here. 
we get down to teaching, tutoring, teaching assistant, bio bus. Uh, again, I highlighted here that you did expand out to when you estimate to start medical school in mm -hmm. August of 2022. Um, so that makes sense and, and definitely something you can do. You can do the same thing with the hours for AMCAS. You can estimate out the, the end date and estimate the hours for that. Um, so perfect way of doing that. The uh, activity descriptions were good. Nothing, oh my gosh, blow me out of the water, but they're mm -hmm. good, they're solid. Um, no, no specific uh, things to highlight in each of these. You have lots and lots and lots of research. And to me, I think that was the thing that stood out the most in your application. Mm -hmm. uh, as I was going down, I'm like, wow, there's there's not a lot of clinical experience here. There's tons of research. Right. Um, but then we get to some clinical experience near the end of this list. Um, so we can, we can look at that. So obviously for me looking at this, I'm like, okay, this person is really inquisitive, really uh, is involved in research, wants to ask questions. Or that was just the easiest thing that she can get involved in, and that's what mm -hmm. she does. What do you mm -hmm. think it was for you? Honestly, so initially I started out doing a lot of uh, mentoring and teaching when I first started out in undergrad, and I was passionate about that. And then I joined um, this ER volunteer program, and I really enjoyed that as well. And I kind of started to like everything along the way, so I wanted to try research. So I joined the summer program. Um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and it really was a combination of teaching, mentorship, research, and clinical care, and that kind of got me interested in academic medicine, and I was hooked on research as soon as I finished that eight-week summer program, so I asked my mentor and PI to stay on. They said yes, and I kept, I kind of kept at it. I'm uh, something I'm very passionate about, and I uh, continue to this day. Nice. Okay. Makes sense. Um, passion, right? That's what you were passionate about. And that's mm -hmm. what comes through in your application. That's what comes through in your interview. And that's what human beings resonate with is, is passion. So great job. Um, you have some coronavirus research here uh, that you were doing back at the, mm -hmm. the start of the pandemic. Um, and then you have a publication here um, as a co-author. And you basically used kind of the official citation language here. I much prefer stories versus citation. Got it. I, I don't think students need to put citations here. Like it, having all of this information is important. The title mm -hmm. of the research potentially so that I can go into PubMed and find it. But the mm -hmm. full citation usually in my mind is just not impactful and, and a wasted opportunity to mm -hmm. again, connect more. Right. Um, 100%. Again, research lab, research intern here, 2,000 hours. Great job. Uh, again, good, good, solid um, descriptions that you have here. We get to shadowing experiences, right? You list all of your shadowing here uh, and tons of shadowing. And I, I think you had mentioned in, in kind of your application to Mission Accepted that people commented on your, your kind of variety of shadowing. First of all, uh, in, in terms of how you labeled it here, Perfect, right? Just listing mm -hmm. it out. Great job. Nothing to do differently there. Second of all, people watching this be like, um, hello, I can't find one physician to shadow. How did you find eight or seven <laughs> or whatever this is? Yeah, it's it's definitely tricky. So I was, like I said, I was part of that summer program. And as soon as I shadowed one physician, I'd say, you know, I really enjoyed my time with you. Do you know anybody else? And they'd be like, oh, of course. Uh, XYZ doctor, they would love to have students to shadow. And then I shadow that doctor. And then I asked that doctor, hey, do you know anybody else? Yeah. So I think just being comfortable asking for the things that you're interested in. I think a lot of students get a little intimidated or nervous or feel that they'll be rejected, which is understandable. Um, but I think just asking um, when you're in the opportunity or in the position to gain additional experience can really help. So I kind of just as like a game of telephone. I asked one doctor, they, yeah. they shot me off to another doctor and that's kind of how yeah. um, I gained all the ex the, these experiences, yeah. Beautiful, perfect. That's exactly how it works. Uh, and not enough people do that. They're scared right. to ask. So it all starts first and foremost with being a good shadow, right? You sh showing up on time, dressing appropriately, uh, behaving appropriately, all of that stuff during the actual encounter the, the patient interaction. So it has to start with that. And then it leads to Dr. Smith, I really enjoyed my time with you. Do you know anyone mm -hmm. else that would allow me to shadow them? And they would go, okay, 
you were appropriate, you, you, you showed up on time, you're a professional, blah, blah, blah. Yes, I enjoyed my time with you. Uh, Dr. Johnson uh, would, would probably also let you shadow. I'll, I'll connect you to, right? Right, exactly, yep. I, I sold, and, and lots of, of students, the college students know this, the Cutco knives thing that, that lots of college students sell Cutco knives in college. I did that in college. Mm -hmm. I loved it. <laughs> and one of the common things that we would do is in the at the end of a sales presentation and closing out a sale and selling knives to someone is, hey, Mrs. Johnson, do you know anyone else who would benefit from having really nice knives like these? And they go, <laughs> oh, yeah, our neighbor Sally and, and Jenny and whoever. <laughs> and they would give you, like, they would whip out their Rolodex, <laughs> their old school Rolodex, and now and obviously on their phone, um, mm -hmm. and, and just give you phone numbers. Uh, and so that's that's a thousand percent the, the perfect way to do that. So great job with that. Thank you, thank you. Um, all right, more research, right? Again, very, very research heavy. Uh, and this time you have a nice little story here, right? You talked about after spending several hours on the task and seeing my DNA, <laughs> DNA yield nearly zero, I love, and I've talked about this before, I love for research, like talk about a mistake. It shows right, exactly. that you're human, like, like and, mm -hmm. and here's what you learned and and, and you, you have a nice little ending here of like, I felt more confident in my abilities as a scientist. So nice little story that again, lets me see who you are versus I knew how to uh, run these kind of assays and do this right. sort of sort of statistical regression analysis, whatever. Um, so great job. Presentations, posters, obviously with all that research, you're presenting it. Again, nice list there. Uh, honors, awards, recognitions. Again, nice list there. Again, I'm I'm getting worried. I'm like, where's the clinical experience? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Understandably, I was looking at it uh, in preparation for today, and I was like, I know exactly what he's going to be thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, biology tutor, again, great little story here of mm -hmm. uh, one of your students and fearing she would fail course uh, after receiving the 55 on her first exam. So nice little story there. I highlighted the beginning of this most meaningful because it seemed like I, I didn't understand the backstory of like, mm. oh, when I started biology, here are my thoughts. So to mm -hmm. me, it's probably probably not needed. Obviously, didn't hurt you in the in the long run, but but potentially a waste of space to show impact mm -hmm. for this activity. You kind of hit the rewind button and said, well, let me set up my thoughts on biology to begin with. So mm -hmm. uh, a little strange, but uh, again, no no huge issues there. Uh, and then we get to emergency room volunteer. I'm like, okay, here's some clinical experience. <laughs> um, and you can see it went over a several year period of time. It did end uh, at the beginning or end of COVID or be beginning yes, of COVID. Yes, yes. I don't know when we'll see the end of COVID, but the beginning of COVID. Uh, hopefully soon. <laughs> yes. And it was only 200 hours. So not a lot right. of hours for the amount of months that you put into this. But right. it kind of makes sense with as much research as you were doing. So again, there's no mm -hmm. cookie cutter. Students are always asking like, how many hours should I get? I'm like, I don't know, get as many as you can. And so for you, as many as you could was 200 given that it ended because of COVID. And with right. all of the other commitments that you had with the research that you're doing, that you were probably more passionate about. Uh, and that's okay, all right? That is okay. So the one thing that I, I point out, it's a very common, uh, common thing to do is to talk about why medicine in the activity section. I just don't think you need to. Again, I think mm, okay. I, I look at everything from a, is it adding to my understanding of you in this particular activity? Mm -hmm. That's what the activity section is for. And lots of students use it as a, and this is why I want to be a doctor. I'm like, well, that's what the personal section right. is for. Let's, let's leave it at that. Um, but again, overall good uh, activity description. Now, I, I don't know if you did this or maybe my team did this, but the names of the patients on here are, are anonymized. We, we whited them out. Um, oh, okay, okay. Did you do that or did we do that? I think it was on your end. I think I know okay. why because I never, I never put the names in quotes. quotes. Okay. Perfect. Um, but they were not the actual patient names. It was just <laughs> wanted to save up on characters. <laughs> yeah. So, so my general recommendation, if you're right. you're new to this, is never use real names. Always use always use fake names. And my recommendation is 
the first time you use the name, just put it in quotes. Mm. You don't have to put it in quotes every time, just the first time. And that lets everyone know, like, hey, I understand HIPAA. It's a thing. Just just so you know, I know, like, we're good. <laughs> um, and, and that's safe. And so my team probably was just extra cautious, and they're like, okay, I'm right. just going to get rid of all these. Um, perfect. Um, health educator, another great story here. Leadership, student director, and mentor, another good story. So you got into the stories once you got out of the research realm, right? The the yes. top the top <laughs> half of the activities description, very research heavy, not a lot of opportunities for stories. Mm-hmm. Although you did have that one kind of mistake or or, or uh, issue that you ran into. And then you got into the more interaction with people stories and you told great stories here. Um, so great job with all of that. And then we get to your personal statement. And you said, right, we started it in September the year before. Right. And, and in your comment uh, on your application, it's your 30th draft. <laughs> yes. Talk <laughs> many, about that. Many drafts. <laughs> How do you not go crazy writing 30 drafts? Honestly, I knew I would have trouble writing my personal statement because as many students, there's not just one reason for why you want to go into medicine. There's a collection of reasons. But of course, there's not enough space to talk about uh, 10, 20 reasons for why you want to go into medicine, you only have enough space to discuss two or three stories and expand yeah. upon those. So I think for me, I re- I was initially struggling to form connections between the things that I did and I was passionate about. But I think as I was going through all those drafts, 20, 30 drafts, maybe more, honestly, yeah. <laughs> I started to form connections and think about, you know, why I did what I did. I was thinking about intention, you know, why did I participate in your volunteering? Why did I do research um, and things like that? So it was definitely a strenuous process, but I think it was worth it. And I knew I couldn't submit something that I didn't feel like I represented myself as much as I possibly could. Uh, I knew I would be done with my personal statement once I finished it. I was like, okay, this is it. But I, you know, I kept writing drafts. And these drafts, I was like, hmm, I don't know, it's it's not me yet. And I kept writing and writing. And finally, at, at the end, I felt like, okay, this is me. I'm representing myself in the best way. I know how it's not perfect, of course, but I think, you know, this is me and hopefully schools like that. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, There's a quote that I heard uh, a couple of years ago that I really love. And it was basically like, art is never finished. It just stops Mm. in interesting points. All right. So as you're working on essays and activity descriptions and secondary essays, you will never feel done. But at some point you have to go, this is an interesting stopping point. I'm just, it's good enough, right? <laughs> right. Uh, and, and so uh, I think that's the, the perfect way to, to say kind of your, your thoughts and feelings as you're going through this process. Um, so really interesting seed here at the beginning, talking about your dad and his tough, tough kind of, uh, uh, kind of persona. Um, and like, oh, there's this health scare potentially, like what's going mm-hmm. on? Um, so nice little seed here. And you go, you go through this process And you say, like, ultimately, these experiences fueled my initial interest in medicine. So I put a question here, which is a very common question that I ask, and that's why, right? Mm. Why did this fuel your interest in medicine? So it's a very common statement that students make of, like, this fueled my interest because, right? Right, I see what you're saying, yeah. So so it's missing that that reason why. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, And then you get into the little bit of a long transition point here of like, well, serving as a voice for my parents and then growing up in New York City, I wanted to learn and connect with patients. Um, And so it basically was a long transition to say, okay, I started to volunteer in the ER. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Again, (laughs) I, I try to look for where in your essays, your activity descriptions, because character count is a very scarce resource where there are potential opportunities to cut things out so that we can focus mm-hmm. on impact and 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 story more and this mm-hmm. is a potential point obviously Definitely. you told the story in your 5300 characters well enough to to get 10 interviews and and mm-hmm. and several acceptances mm-hmm. uh, but for others looking at this struggling like oh i'm at 5500 or 5400 characters this is the type of stuff that could be cut out um, right. Uh, again, you have a, a great little watering, uh, uh, watering of the seed, as as I call it in my personal statement book, uh, talking about this patient interaction. Great. Um, and then you 
talk about this next paragraph. So you, ha you have this list of extracurriculars. And so you're kind of re rehashing things that you've already talked about in your activity description. And then I, um, I get to a point of like, okay, as I'm reading, I'm like, why am I reading this? Why am I reading this? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm re reading these ECs and I get to the point of like, okay, understand why I'm reading this. You're telling me you weren't really sure what you wanted to do until after all these experiences and you realize, oh, I need to be a physician. So mm -hmm. potentially, and I'm very much a like put it straight in your face kind of person, potentially mm -hmm. could have made that a lot clearer of like, I was, right. I was thinking of becoming a PA, but here's why I'm not, right? Mm -hmm. Versus here's a list of extracurriculars I did and ultimately decided I wanted to be a physician. So right. I, I had to parse apart and I've read so many essays over time yeah. that I'm like, okay, <laughs> I know what you're trying to say here. Um, right, right. <laughs> uh, but that's again, a, that's a great point. Uh, obviously, you, you did the job that you needed to do. Um, another experience here, uh, watering the seed. Uh, you talk about some research here. Again, I typically don't rec recommend talking about research, but you have some research mm -hmm. in here and uh, it's a transition to talking about a patient. So another long, mm -hmm. long transition and, and EC of like, oh, I did all this research and now let me tell you about a patient that I did. Mm -hmm. So good job talking about the patient. You get the story um, and you uh, talk about the impact that it had on you. Perfect. Um, you finish with the conclusion, uh, and, and I love really strong, like, here's what I'm going to do in the future, really big aspirational things. And lots of students kind of peter out at the conclusion of like, oh, like I used all my brain power <laughs> trying to remember these stories. I just need to tell you that I, I know I want to be a doctor and, and that's how they finish. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. kind of what you did here, right? Is like, I find that my, uh, that as my journey continues, each patient, each experiment, each hurdle strengthens my resolve to become an academic physician. Great. Right. Obviously you want to be a physician. You're applying to medical school. Mm -hmm. Now I want to know what are you going to do with this diploma that I'm going to give you? So that's where right. I like to take the conclusion. Um, overall, solid essay uh, that, that helps me understand your path, your journey. Uh, unfortunately, you, uh, you, you got rid of all of the schools uh, on your application. So I, I don't know the schools that you apply to, but just in general, how did you, how did you pick schools to apply to? Yeah, so I use um, MSR a lot of it. I the, I had like a list of schools. Of course, there's no safety schools for medical school, but I <laughs> I picked schools who I felt I fit in their median or a, at least around their median between 25th and 75th percentile, according to MSAR. So that made the bulk of my list. And then I had, uh, I applied to three DO schools. And then there were a few schools, I want to say maybe five or six that were kind of shoot your shot schools, schools that, you know, maybe wouldn't reach out to me, but I would regret not applying. And I will say my advice to everybody is apply, shoot your shot. You never know. Um, a lot of my state schools haven't even reached out to me, but a lot of those sh my shot schools have reached out to me. Um, and I didn't expect it. You know, my, like you said, my MCAT just about the average of accepted MD students. And a lot of these bigger schools that, you know, top 20, top five, top 10 schools, they want people with high stats. But, um, as I was applying, I realized that they really do care about your story. And, uh, that's a way of saying apply. Don't be afraid to shoot your shots. You never know. You'll regret it in the future, I think. You know, yeah. you never want to go through things saying, oh, I, I should apply to Harvard or I should apply to Cornell. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I am not a fan of of using the MSAR and 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 basing school mm. lists based on stats because right. because what you do in that situation is you're you're telling yourself no instead true. of the school that is is telling you no. That is you so have true. no idea what the schools are looking for. And we can assume based on the MSAR that, oh, they only care about high stats. But here's the problem with that assumption is if every, every student applying to those schools looks at the MSAR and goes, oh, their, their median is a 397, uh, their median MCAT is a, a 522, and they right. go, There's, I don't have a chance the yeah. problem is that the school stats continue to perpetuate those high stats because students are self-selecting out of applying to those schools with the potential of being accepted and mm -hmm. lowering those medians. Now, 
obviously schools play this stupid game with the US News and World Reports because stats are a factor in that ranking. And so mm-hmm. yeah, the top schools want to keep that those top top numbers and say, oh, we're number two in US News and World Reports. Whatever. It's a stupid game. Let them play their game. Shoot your <laughs> shot. Apply where you want to 100%. go, where you think you're going to be a good fit, and, and let the schools tell you no. So obviously you have a solid primary application. You submit early, you get interview invites. Talk about that next step. How did you prepare yourself for interviews? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. So I made sure to schedule as many mock interviews as possible. Um, so I asked my PI, who's a doctor. I asked other mentors at different locations for my college, my advisors. I talked to as many people as I possibly could. And the other thing I did, um, which I think will help, especially for people who don't have as much access to um, doctors or mentors or advisors, is sit in your room, go through your application, and talk through all of your activities. Mm -hmm. Think of at least one story that was impactful for you in a specific activity um, or, you know, answers to the common questions. What does teamwork mean to you? Or why do you want to be a doctor? Why medicine? Uh, talk about a challenge, talk about a weakness. So I think talking out loud can really, really help. I know I was speaking to some students, they also record themselves Mm -hmm. uh, speaking and they try to catch themselves if they say something that they shouldn't have said, or maybe their body language is off. Of course, now with Zoom, you have to be very conscientious of that because they can't see the lower half of our bodies and what we're doing. Um, So I think that can be really helpful. So kind of to wrap that up, um, get as much mock interview practice as possible talk out loud and record yourself if you can. Perfect. And I've made, I I have what I call the anytime mock interview platform, which is a horrible name. Uh, It's (laughs) it's a platform that allows students to go on. I have 600 questions of myself asking like, why do you want to be a doctor? And tell me about yourself. Um, And you can go and create your own uh, kind of interview set, or there's 15 or so kind of pre-made interviews. That's free now. I made that free. That's awesome. Um, so anyone can go to medicalschoolhq.net and access that and record themselves and and get those. Uh, and you can send it and get feedback from other people. So oh, wow. Great, great little platform there. So you don't have to like set up your tripod and your phone <laughs> and figure out how to, how to do all that. What was 100%. it like receiving that for uh, that first acceptance? Oh, wow. Yeah. So I remember being in lab doing an experiment as I do. And my I, I, it was October 15th. So I knew... You know, I this the first school I interviewed at, the first MD school, they told us they would be calling us on October 15th. So naturally, I had my phone right next to me. I was so nervous. Right after the interview, I kept thinking everything I did wrong or things that I shouldn't, <laughs> you know, naturally, like a lot of <laughs> us pre-meds yeah. do after interviews, thinking about all the little things we did wrong or things we shouldn't have said, things we should have said. And I fully convinced myself, I was like, oh yeah, there's no way the school's accepting me. <laughs> but, you know, thankfully I got that phone call October 15th. I saw the caller ID and it didn't say unknown. It said the school name. So I knew what was going on. I picked up the phone. I ran out. I went to our equipment room because it's loud. So I thought if I, if I cry, nobody can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I got the call. It was, it was really nice. I, I'll never forget it. Um, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, like 20 times. And <laughs> The admissions officer on the other side of the phone was like, are you okay? I'm like, yes, I'm just really happy. <laughs> and it was nice because that admissions officer and I on interview day, we really connected. We really vibed. And it was nice to hear her voice again and her to be the one telling me, oh, congratulations, you got accepted. Yeah. And, you know, it just felt like everything I did, every all the effort I put in and all the effort other people put into me. Um, was worth it because now I get yeah. to be a doctor. Talk, um, talk about that. And yeah. I, I wanted to ask that that effort that people put into you, right? Again, Definitely. being an immig- immigrant to this country, what did your parents think about this? They they were ecstatic. I mean, like, you know, my, my dad went to middle school. My mom finished high school back in Albania. They came to the States and, you know, they came here for us. They, they had everything back home. They could have been just fine back home. They had jobs and, you know, service jobs, but they wanted better opportunities from my siblings and I. And so they ended up coming here and, you know, just to see everything come into fruition and see their efforts you know, come, come to fruition was really nice. They were so happy. They never pressured me to do anything. Um, I remember when I was younger, I wanted to be an artist. So I went to my dad's room and I was like, dad, I want to be an artist. And he paused and he's like, okay, if that makes you happy. <laughs> yes. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's a much better response but, than, oh my gosh, how are you going to pay your bills? <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. I remember when I eventually told him, Hey, I think I want to go to medical school. He's like, okay. He's like, great. That's awesome. You know, whatever you want, as long as you're passionate about it, you're putting in uh, your effort into it and you love it. That's all that matters. You could be anything as long as you love it, you know? So they were very happy. Um, I'm very happy. I'm excited. So, yeah. well, you should be congratulations on all your thank success, you, you. both that you've uh, achieved up to this point and the application cycle is still going. So uh, I know you got a, a new interview invite and mm-hmm. hopefully you crush that one. Uh, thank and you. you have lots of options to choose from both from a culture curriculum standpoint and hopefully from a financial aid standpoint as well. Thank you again for coming on and sharing your story you, and, and helping everyone else on their journey. Thank you.